Tonight's presentation is titled Cylinder Rescue. And our presenter is Mike Bush. Mike is president of Savvy Aviation Incorporated. He's also a author for numerous aviation publications and uh, holds a certified flight instructor certificate, uh, A&P mechanics certificate with the IA privileges, aviation maintenance technician of the year with the FAA in 2008 and a member of EAA. Mike, thanks a lot for being with us tonight. I'm gonna turn control the presentation over to you. Evening, Tim, evening, everybody. Tonight's presentation, uh, Cylinder Rescue, um, is uh, hopefully has the potential of saving you guys a lot of money. And um, I'm going to uh, use a actual story about one of our clients uh, to illustrate what I wanna talk about with regard to rescuing cylinders. Um, the client, I will call him Sam, that's not his real name, but he had a, has a 79 um, Piper PA-34-200 uh, Seneca. Um, it was in the shop, it's annual inspection, and uh, Sam was not happy with what the shop uh, told him. Um, what Sam was unhappy about is that the shop did its compression test on the uh, airplane as part of the annual inspection. Uh, the airplane's got two uh, turbo continental engines, TSIO 360 engines, and um, gave Sam some unwelcome news. What I told him was that the engine on the cylinder four on the left engine, a measure 35 over a, and on the right engine, cylinder number three measured 31 over 80. Both of those compressions are well below the uh, the, the no threshold um, panel cylinders, uh, which is typically somewhere in the low 40s. If the compression gets below the low 40s, then the the cylinder is not um, considered to be airworthy. Now these uh, Sam's engines are. 2014 factory rebuilds, flying about 150 to 200 hours a year. So the airplane has been getting well used. Um, that cylinder number four on the left engine that flunked the compression test had been replaced less than 1,100 hours ago. And the number three cylinder on the right engine that also flunked the compression test had been replaced a, only 500 hours and Sam said, <laughs> and I love this he said it cannot be normal to have replaced nine cylinders in 700 hours two of them twice um, but that's what he was uh, he was facing. He had already replaced seven cylinders on these on this these factory rebuilt engines that that went on the airplane in 2014, and now the shop is telling him um, that two more cylinders have to get replaced. And Sam is thinking, I must be doing something drastically wrong to be going through all these cylinders uh, so quickly. What am I doing wrong? So what I told Sam was <clears throat> that repetitive cylinder removals that he was experiencing often trigger guilt feelings uh, on the part of the aircraft owner, feeling that they must be doing something wrong. But in actual fact, majority of the time is, it, it usually is not the fault of the pilot. It really has nothing to do with what they're, how they're flying the airplane. More likely, uh, it's the fault of uh, 
what I call trigger happy mechanics, we're trained that low compression automatically re requires removing the cylinder. Um, and what I indicated this was that because the cylinder flunks the compression test doesn't re doesn't mean it has to come off. So that's really what I want to talk to you about tonight is rescuing cylinders that flunk a compression test without having to remove the cylinder from the engine. Um, I hate to pull cylinders off, uh, and we try not to do that, um, except as a very last resort. And we always want to see if we can rescue the cylinder uh, before deciding that it has to come off. So what a cylinder that flunks a compression test does require good bore scope inspection to figure out why the compression is low. Um, and Continental, uh, their, their um, standard practice manual, uh, manual M0, actually says that you have to do a, a bore scope inspection every time you do a compression test. Now, it still amazes me how many mechanics don't do this, how many mechanics either don't have a bore scope uh, or don't uh, use it on a regular basis and, and rely strictly on compression tests. But the compression test um, is not really a reliable test of cylinder condition, and the bore scope is much more revealing in terms of what actually is wrong. So we want to scope this, and the reason for compression has established through the bore scope inspection. It's often possible to remediate them without removing the cylinder, perhaps especially if the problem has been caught early enough that uh, that the, the cylinder is still salvable. Sometimes it's not, but if we're doing, you know, regular bore scope inspections, we should be able to catch problems early enough uh, that we can do something about them. And as I mentioned, since 2003, Continental has required a bore scope inspection anytime a compression test is done. Uh, that guidance originally was in a service bulletin SB03-3, but um, now has been incorporated into their standard practices manual M0. The bore scope inspection um, is, a, is a quick and easy thing to do, especially at annual inspection when the spark plugs have to come out anyway for you know, cleaning and gapping and so on. Um, anytime a top spark plug comes off a cylinder, it seems to me to be a crime not to, not to stick a bore scope in the cylinder and look around. Um, and doing a bore scope inspection is is actually a preventive maintenance. It's something that an aircraft owner can do for themselves or by, by themselves without even getting an A and P involved. So when when our clients um, wind up using mechanics that that either don't have a bore scope or aren't really sold it boroscopy is a is a worthwhile thing to do we, we we will often urge them if they're if they're hands-on kinds of owners that do their own oil chain and so on will will suggest that they go out and buy their own or do their own bore scope um and do a bore scope that we like to recommend these days is the vividia va 400 which is the one that's pictured on this slide and it only costs two hundred and fifty dollars, and it's a really, really excellent bore scope. It uh, is capable of um, producing exceptionally good, very high resolution, well lit images. Has an articulating tip that allows you to get really good looks at the at the valves and even up behind the valve. Um, it's it's just a it's a it's a really good bore scope. It used to be that a good bore scope was at least two thousand bucks. Now the price has come down dramatically, and uh, the selling price on this Vividia VA400 is, is about $250. So 
So if the borescope images reveal that the exhaust valve is burned, then we have to do something about it because a burned exhaust valve is just gonna get worse fast. But if it's not burned too badly, um, we can generally remediate the problem um, simply by lapping the valve and seat in place. Um, we also, when we do that, we, we, we normally recommend that the, that the rotator cap or rotocoil, the thing that rotates the valve, be changed, um, particularly on continentals, because we've seen an awful lot of rotocoil failures, and that's one of the leading causes of burned valves is that the rotocoil has stopped working and the valve isn't rotating anymore, uh, and it develops a, a hot spot. So, um, if the valve is 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 burned really really badly where there's significant metal erosion it may be too far gone uh to to lap in place um but if if we catch it reasonably early um the, lapping the valve in place will will usually solve the problem and it's a simple enough procedure that it's worth it's worth a shot um Now, if the valve does not appear to be burned under the borescope, um, then Continental says, go fly the airplane for at least 45 minutes and then recheck the compression hot. And in our experience, doing that almost always brings the compression rating up by 10 to 20 points. I had one, uh, one client that uh, was in Florida, had a Cirrus SR22, had a cylinder that read 38 over 80 uh, the shop wanted to pull it uh, we convinced them that that they should allow the owner to follow the continental guidance and go fly our plane for four or five minutes or so and, and and bring it back and recheck the compression hot and that 38 over 80 cylinder uh, on the retest magically tested at 72 over 80. <laughs> You know, a cold compression check is almost worthless. The compression test itself is a, is a pretty terrible, but but if, if you're going to do it at all, it has to be done hot. Um, this is particularly a problem with twins because they have so many cylinders. I know on, on my airplane, you know, but when I do my own annual inspection, I go fly the airplane, I push it in the hangar, take the cowls off and take the top spark plugs out and quickly go around to do compression tests. And by the time I get to the second engine, those cylinders are getting pretty cool. You know, you, there's only you can only do the test so quickly, and um, you know, the the colder the the test is, the more worthless it, worthless it is. So, um, doing the you know heating up the cylinders, the, 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 let's say the one that flunked, and uh, and and retesting it hot will almost always bring the compression reading up dramatically. If the leakage is uh, is past the rings and not past the exhaust valve. At any rate, uh, we we give Sam these recommendations. He comes back and he says, "Well, my A and P doesn't have a decent borescope. He doesn't believe in borescopes, but but I actually have one because I attended w one of my uh, talks at at Oshkosh last year and heard him talking about the the, the benefits of boroscopy. So I went out and I bought myself a VA 400, and um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go to the shop with my borescope and do my own borescope inspection with my A&P looking over my shoulder, which I thought was really pretty cool. I was starting to like Sam, and I wish all aircraft owners were as proactive with their maintenance as uh, as he was. So at any rate, they. Uh, they do the borescope inspection, and he gets a bunch of really nice images, and and uh, and sends them to us to take a look at. Um, this cylinder was uh, cylinder number five on the right engine. and th this is not one of the cylinders that that flunked the compression test. In fact, it it was very good on the compression test at, at, at seventy over eighty. And uh, if you if you look at these. Uh, at these images, uh, you'll see that this is a really, really beautiful looking cylinder. The, the exhaust valve is 
appears perfectly symmetrical with no signs of any hot spots. The cylinder walls has still have a beautiful crosshatch pattern from from the hull, and they they look like they haven't worn hardly at all. So th this is you know this is just a this is a gorgeous cylinder. This is exactly what we want to see when we stick a borescope in the cylinder, and it's what we'll see if the cylinder is pretty low time. Um, so then we took a look at the at the cylinders that that flunked the compression test. Um, this one was uh, number three from the right engine, uh, and it came up at uh, 31 over 80 on the compression test. And um, the exhaust valve um, didn't didn't look really good, but it it wasn't horrible either. It it, it looked like it was kind of in the early stages of of, of failing. Um, the cylinder walls looked looked fine. They, they had plenty of crosshatch left. Uh, didn't look like they were worn excessively. And the mechanic had confirmed that when he did the compression test on this cylinder, he heard the, the air coming out the exhaust. So clearly the problem was with the exhaust valve, but looking at the exhaust valve, it wasn't particularly terrible. So this was a really good candidate for lapping in place. Uh, just just cleaning up the interface between the valve and the seat so that they so that they seal better. Um, and this clearly wasn't a valve that was too far gone or had a lot of metal erosion, so it was a perfect candidate uh, for doing that. Um, the other cylinder that flunked the compression test, um, left engine number four, which measured out at 35 over 80. Um, the mechanic reported that the air was leaking past the rings on this cylinder. And um, you can kind of see why, because if you look at the lower picture there of the, of the cylinder walls, um, the cylinder doesn't have any crosshatch left and uh, they're, they're, it, it looks pretty badly worn. Um, so we, didn't, we weren't particularly optimistic about being able to save this cylinder, but we thought it was, it was worth it was worth a shot to do that, and it, with with cylinders where um, the leakage is past the rings, um, the way we try to rescue them, and it's not always successful, but it's so easy to do that it's worth trying, is uh, is what we call a a, a solvent flush, um, and that's a procedure where where you you basically fill a combustion chamber full of, of fluid, full, full of a solvent. And then with the spark plugs inserted, you, you, you pull the prop through, which forces the solvent through the ring pack, cleans out any gunk that, that may have accumulated in the, in, the, um, in the ring grooves and particularly in the little holes that feed the oil control ring and so on. Um, so we thought it would be worth a, a shot to do a ring wash on this cylinder um, to see if we could bring the compression up uh, to something uh, acceptable. But we told Sam not to get his hopes up that this cylinder was pretty badly worn and it might it might have to come off. But we were going to try to see if we could buy him a little more time. So we, we've got write-ups on how to do these things, um, and I'll um, I'll put these URLs up uh, during the Q and A uh, so you can write them down. Um, but the first one about exhaust valve lapping an article that my colleague Paul New wrote. He, he does this a lot in his shop and uh, explains what the procedure is and so on. And the the second URL takes you to a write-up of a uh, the what we call the oil control ring solvent flush procedure. It talks about how to mix up the solvent and how to do the and, and cautions to make sure you're doing it right. All this stuff is available. Put up these URLs for you uh, uh, during the Q and A, and I'll put, uh, write them down. So we made these recommendations to Sam to 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 do lapping of the valve on the one cylinder that had the, the exhaust valve leak problem and to do a solvent flush on the cylinder that had the warm barrel. 
And uh, so he talks to his mechanic, he comes back, he says, my, my, my NP has never done the lapping or exhaust valve in place procedures. Um, he, he says he's heard uh, a, a, about it, but he's never done it and he's a little skittish to try it. He also says he's never done the ring flush procedure, never even heard of it before. Um, and said, I told him that, you know, I thought it couldn't hurt to try these things. And, and if he screws it up, then we're back where we were before and replacing the cylinder. But it seemed like it was worth a shot to try to prevent the cylinder removal. And Sam says he, he still seems reluctant. So we, 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 we gave Sam a little ammunition to use with his big and said, you know, lapping of the valves is something that's always done uh, it, whenever valves or, or seats are worked on. Um, but many ANPs, including Sam's, never done it because they work on two cylinder repairs and they don't work at an engine shop. Um, but it's, you know, it's a procedure that's that's done all the time. Uh, and th there's no reason not to try it. And it's very easy. And the solvent procedure is is so simple that you know Sam could do it himself. It's really preventive maintenance. Um, it, it simply involves removing the top spark plug of the cylinder, rotating the prop to bring the piston to bottom dead center um, on the compression, filling up the com the combustion chamber solvent that we write up in our little write up. Um, and then put the top spark plug back on and pull the cylinder, pull the prop through to force that solvent past the rings. And uh, we typically repeat it several times. And if it's successful, uh, you'll feel it, that it's easier and easier each time you do it to, to pull the prop through because it's it's rinsing uh, a bunch of gunk out of that's accumulated in the in the ring grooves and then the oil feed holes to, for the oil control ring. Um, and you know if, it, if it's if, if it's not successful, you you can you know it's it's a good diagnostic procedure that tells you that you know you've got a problem with with a serious uh, um, lead sludge accumulation in in that thing and. If it's real bad, you're going to have to pull a cylinder and clean up the piston. But if it's not real bad, sometimes you can clean it up using this this flush procedure without pulling the cylinder off. So we said, look, you know, if your mechanic isn't isn't willing to do it, it's something you could do yourself. It's 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 preventive maintenance. It's you know, it doesn't involve anything that 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 an owner ought to do. You move spark plugs and put in spark plugs and drain the oil and all that stuff. It, it, it's not rocket science. So Sam comes back and says, I found another mechanic who's, who's familiar with the lapping procedure and he was quite comfortable doing it. So we got this other mechanic to lap the valve on the three cylinder on the right engine um, and uh, brought the compression um, from 31 over 80 up to 60 over 80. And that was tested cold, so the expectation was that when it was hot, it would probably be even better than that. But 60 over 80 is a very respectable compression for a Continental engine. Like I say, no-go thresholds down in the low 40s. Um, and we said, did, uh, we, we asked him, he said, well, did you remember to ask the mechanic to install a, a new rotator cap when he put the valve rings back on? Because frequently the failure of the rotator cap is is what caused the valve to start leaking. Um, and Sam came back and the mechanic says that rotator caps only apply to light combing engines. Continental don't have rotator cap. Well, it turns out that's definitely not the case. Uh, Continental engines certainly do have rotator caps, but the Continental terminology is a little bit different. Light combing calls them a rotator cap. A Continental calls them a, a roto coil, so I think that was what was confusing him. So we sent him a, a copy of the exploded uh, parts diagram from parts manual for Continental for his engine, and sold where the roto coil 
was in that parts diagram. Gave him the part number and everything. And uh, so Sam went and ordered a, a, a new rotocoil and had the mechanic install it uh, on that cylinder that where the valve had been lapped. Um, I'm pausing here because I'm I'm not sure this the slides have fully updated. There we go. Sorry about the slow internet connection. This happened just before we started. But anyway, we've had quite a lot of problems with the the, the continental rotocoils. Uh, that if if you if you sliced open a rotocoil, which is very hard to do. Um, best way to do it is with a letter, but because uh, they're hermetically sealed, but uh, if you sliced open one, this, this is one that's been sliced open, you can see that inside of the rotocoil is a, is a little garter spring, and it's the spring that actually causes the rotation. And that spring uh, over time tends to get flat spotted. Uh, this this in, the, in the photograph is, uh, is a pretty severely flat spotted. This is one that stopped working. And this is the reason they stop working is because the spring um, the, the spring wears out. And the rotocoils aren't terribly expensive. And so we just tend to, anytime we've got a valve problem, we, we tend to just replace the rotocoil um, just because, you know, you've got the valve springs off and you might as well, it's a good opportunity to replace it. So at any rate, he, he he got his valve lapped and he got a new rotocoil installed and the com the cold compression got up to 60 over 80 and then had a chance to test it high yet, of course, because the engines are still apart. Um, and they did do the ring flush procedure. Uh, uh, Sam uh, participated in it and uh, did the ring flush procedure on that other cylinder. And after he finished the ring flush procedure, the compression on that cylinder cold uh, went up from 35 over 80 to 58 over 80, which again is a very, it's a perfectly respectable compression for Continental Engine. And that was a cold compression. So we expected that it might get a little bit better. Um, that was a cylinder that had the worn barrel and, and it, it's, you know, it's eventually gonna have to go because the barrel's pretty worn, but um, there's no no reason to pull it before it has to be, and in, in this case, it clearly didn't really have to be. So Sam says, once everything's back together, we'll do a long ground run and then recheck the compression, and if it looks good, he'll do a test flight for about an hour, and then they'll do another compression test hot. So they went ahead and did that, and um, uh, he, he actually decided uh, to to just fly the airplane for um, 15 minutes and then um, do the compression test hot. And when they did the compression test hot, the right engine that, that had the exhaust valve issue and, and it tested 31 over 80 came in at 73 over 80. So uh, that gives you an idea of just how effective the uh, uh, the lapping procedure was. And this left engine, the one that had the worn barrel, um, uh, measured 63 over 80, um, up from 35 over 80. So again, that that is a perfectly respectable compression. Um, it's that compression on that cylinder is probably going to continue to go down because the barrel is pretty worn and eventually that cylinder is going to have to go. But it didn't need to go at this point for sure. So Sam was uh, was was very happy that we rescued his two cylinders, and he kind of wished that maybe he'd known about this stuff before he had replaced seven cylinders uh, previously, because probably a lot of them could have been saved. Um, Sam said. Uh, it, it, he said, by the way, it was interesting to see uh, my mechanic shift his attitude as this unfolded. He said, my A&P has a very low quality borescope that he seldom uses. And um, he, uh, he he watched the inspection myself with the PA 400. 
And he was amazed at the image quality and the scope's ability to articulate and, and, and see the valves and kind of valves and everything. They're just in stunning uh, um, detail. And as you could see some of the pictures that I had up on the slides. And he says the mechanic's parting comment was, I got to get me one of those. <laughs> So he became a, a converted to uh, to, to the Bohr's scope, which is nice to hear. Uh, I guess we can just make progress one mechanic at a time. But uh, you know, bottom line is so many A and P's are spring loaded to remove cylinders that flunk the compression test um, without making any effort to uh, uh, to remediate the problem in a, in a less invasive way. Um, so we, we always want to use the bore scope to try to identify exactly what the situation is and, and how far gone the cylinder is. Um, and then if we can, to you know, resolve the problem without removing the cylinder. You know, if the bore scope reveals that things are too far gone, sometimes you'll see a really, really badly burned valve, with a lot of metal erosion and so on. And then it'll be very clear just from what you see in the bore scope that, um, that 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 valve has progressed too far to be lapped in place and it's, it's going to have to have a new valve installed, which would require cylinder removal. But, you know, probably more times than not, it isn't a pull a cylinder. We can, we can solve the problem. Um, and make the cylinder airworthy again uh, uh, while it's while it's still on the engine without removing it. And if the cylinder can be rested without removal, it's always the best option um, because you know as covered before in previous webinars, cylinder work not only is is very expensive, but it's also quite risky. Uh, there just there have been a lot of catastrophic engine failures following cylinder work because there's just so many ways that you can mess it up. And so we really hate, just from a, from a safety standpoint, uh, as well as a cost standpoint, we really hate to see cylinder pull, cylinders pulled, unless there's really no alternative. Um, and uh, you know, in some case illustrates that frequently there there is an alternative. And we've had tremendous amount of success with the valve lapping procedure. We've had, you know, mixed success with with the solvent flush. Some sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But it's such a simple thing to do that it seems like it's shot to try it before uh, committing a cylinder. So uh, that's all I have. We can open it up for some Q and A. I I hope the the lag in the present because of my internet connection has been too terrible. And I do, I do have uh, both of those URLs up here on the slide. They'll stay up here during Q&A. So if you want to scribble them down and pull up those documents, um, I'd be happy for you to do that. So Tim, let's, uh, let's open up for some questions. All right, Mike. Well, thank you very much. Interesting presentation. And uh, it, no, I didn't think your audio was was that bad at all. I mean, there was a couple times where it dropped out a little bit, but I, you know, and I think most everybody was able to understand really good. Only a few people were having issues, it seemed like. Um, okay, well, sorry, several sorry people... about the technical problem. <laughs> Yeah, several people asked this question um, as Michael's. Um, what solvent was used for the uh, solvent cylinder flush? Well, it's 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 at the very top of that document. Um, uh, what the what the <coughs> recommended mixture is. Um, so if you if you go to the bit.ly slash solvent flush, uh, that's the very first thing on that document. I think I might have had it visible on one of the slides here. Just give me a second. Yeah, here it is. Uh, it may be a little bit hard, um, but uh, I'm, I'm just putting up the slide that had the, the, the top of that document. You can see the very first thing up there is a solvent mixture. It's a 
it's a it says mix in a five gallon pellet, one gallon of uh, metal spirits or one gallon of zine and uh Arish lw 100 or it's probably not great or two quarts of Arish lw 100 and you mix it up in a bucket use that for the solvent that's what we recommend it, you know the solvent mixture isn't terribly critical um it, because what we're really doing is is kind of trying to force the stuff out uh, mechanically through pressure so the most important thing is that it's a liquid but um, that's a fairly non-viscous liquid but that's the uh that's the mixture that uh, that we recommend using in the and the the detailed procedure for doing the solvent flush is in this document okay um, several people are wondering this. Uh, Jeff's question, where does the solvent go during a solvent flush? Does the oil need to be replaced after the flush is done? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, when you do the solvent flush, you're you're totally contaminating the, the oil that's in there. So, um, I mean, it, you know, frequently it's done at an annual where you're doing an oil change and you probably drain the oil out, but yeah, the solvent winds up going into the oil sump and, and you, you drain it out um, and, and service the engine with uh, with fresh oil after the whole thing is done, for sure. Jerry wonders, how about doing the solvent flush procedure as routine maintenance, say every 500 hours? What do you think about that? Uh, it's actually not a bad idea to do that. Um, I would think maybe 500 hours would be would be a very good uh, interval. Um, if, if what what happens is that um, that that lead based sludge uh, will build up in in the uh, in in the ring grooves and in the oil control ring feed holes over time. Um, it's worse in some engines than, than others. We've had real a lot of these, a lot of problems with the Cirruses and the Columbia 400s that have IO 550s with very small oil sumps, um, be, because you're uh, asking a small amount of oil to absorb an awful lot of blow by. But but in any case, um, if if the sludge gets too bad then the ring flush procedure won't succeed. I, I remember I did a ring flush procedure uh, on on one of my engines at, at very high time because we only started doing this a couple of years ago. And um, I was able to clean out 11 out of the 12 cylinders on my Cesta 310, but there was one that just, uh, that that no matter what I did, I couldn't, I, I couldn't get that solvent to pass through the ring packs um, smoothly, and that that one had just gotten so badly contaminated that that it was beyond the ability to uh, uh, to flush it out. So I, you know, I I would think it, it it's probably a good idea to do this procedure prophylactically every 500 hours. It's certainly um, it certainly hurt, and I would think 500 hours would be just about the right interval. Okay, great. Uh, Carl was then wondering, um, when you do the the cylinder flush, uh, is there is there risk of cylinder head damage? Cylinder uh, similar to what an oil related hydraulic lock in the bottom cylinder of a radial engine might experience. Uh, there's there's no danger. I mean, you 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 are intentionally hydrostatically locking the cylinder. It's exactly what you're doing, but but you, you're only putting as much pressure as a human being can can apply pulling on a propeller blade, which isn't enough to damage anything. Um, and you know, and like I say, if the cylinder is really badly sludged up, you'll find that you you just can't pull the prop through. It won't. It, you're not strong enough to do it. Um, but no, there's 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 no way you can hurt anything with this procedure because it's 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 not um, you, you know you 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 can only apply less than a horsepower to the engine, so 
you're just not strong enough to, to damage anything. All right, Rick was wondering, when you lap the valve in position, how do you remove the lapping compound? Is it risky that the compound will end up in the oil? Um, uh, that's a question that, that always comes up. And, and it's this is, again, basically a risk-free procedure. Um, uh, after the procedure, we, we, we try to, to spray a little brake cleaner in there and, and, and wash the, the, the uh, grinding compound out but if you think about it if if there was a little grinding compound left in that in that interface between the exhaust valve and the and the seat uh, it, it's it's going to get blown out of the exhaust instantly the minute you start the engine it's not going to get it's not going to get anywhere but but going into the exhaust and and blown out the tailpipe so it's not going to hurt anything like we, we we do tend to try to to, to wash the valve with with some aerosol brake cleaner. Um, the, by the way, the way the way the lapping is done, I didn't get into that, but um, you do have to drop the exhaust manifold off the cylinder so that you can you can access the valve through the exhaust port, and um, uh, and, and you remove valve springs and uh, and you the valve the an electric drill. We we typically use a little piece of rubber hose to couple the drill to the to the valve stem, and you spin the valve with an electric drill while applying um, valve lapping compound to it through the exhaust port. And uh, once the the valve and the seat look nice and shiny, um, you, you 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 wash out the as much of the grinding compound as you can and and put the whole thing back together and it, it it's a pretty simple procedure it's not quite as simple as the ring flush but it's pretty simple and it's amazingly effective jesse was wondering what do the numbers in the compression mean for example the 70 over 80 what do those numbers mean well the way the compression test is is done is um that um, compressed air from a from from an air compressor is is uh, is forced into the cylinder through a compression tester which has a calibrated orifice um, and there are two pressure gauges on it one on each side of the orifice uh, and you adjust the regulator so that the first gauge, the, the, the gauge that's on the compressor side of the orifice reads 80 PSI. And if the cylinder was completely leak free, uh, the, the air would just fill up the cylinder and, and, and then everything would stop and both gauges would read 80. But of course, cylinders are never completely leak free. So the, the faster air leaks out of the cylinder, and the more airflow from the compressor is required to keep the cylinder pressurized, uh, the more flow there is through that cal calibrated orifice, and and so the higher the pressure drop is. So the the second gauge reads, which is always less than 80 psi, is an indication of how much leakage the cylinder has. Um, it's, we 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 colloquially call it a compression test. It really ought to be called a leak test because it's just a measurement of of, of how much leakage there is from, uh, out of the combustion chamber past the uh, past the ring pack. Scott wonders for mechanics. Should, you know, while, oh, I was going to say while I, while I'm talking about this. Um, the the reason that it's so important to do the compression test hot is because when the cylinder cools off, um, the aluminum piston contracts a lot more than the steel ball does. And so the fit of the piston in the cylinder gets really, really sloppy when the cylinder is cool. And the hotter you can do the compression test, the, the, the closer the, the the fit is between the piston and the cylinder, 
and the less dependent it, it is on on having the you know the ring seal and of course when the engine is really running and everything is really hot the 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 tolerances between the piston and cylinder are very very close and there's very little leakage so when we do the compression test of course we can't test anywhere close to being as hot as the cylinder is when the engine's actually running so when we're doing a compression test the cylinder always seems a lot leakier than it really is you know when the engine is is operating um the colder it is the the sloppier the fit is and the worse the compression is going to be so a cold compression reading is just about useless um and that that's why we almost always gain 10 or 20 points when when we go fly the airplane and then test the problem cylinder hot right right after we come in from a flight because everything is the the fit of the piston and cylinders is a lot closer tolerance and so the leakage is a lot smaller scott says for mechanics that are hesitant to try valve lapping is there a quote unquote official faa approved dock that we can point them to which would prove that the process is an approved repair or standard practice um, I'm not really aware of it. The, uh, you know, I I would say, at, you know, at least 50% of A and P's have have done valve lapping sometime. It's 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 a very common procedure. Uh, I'm I'm not aware of a, you know, of, of an advisory circular or anything that 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 gives the procedure. The 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 uh, solvent flush is is um, not known by very many people. It was actually in, invented by Ed Collin, who's the lubrication engineer that that, that invented CamGuard, and um, we we started doing it a few years ago, and and it turned to be extremely useful. Um, but it's not it's not very well known. But as I said, the 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 ring flush is. Is something that a, that an owner can do on his own cognizance. It's just it, it would be it's so innocuous that it would be considered preventive maintenance. Um, the, lapping the valve place is not something I think anybody but an A and P could do because you you need to you need to take the valve springs off and stuff. And the, I think that's certainly beyond what any reasonable person would uh, consider to be preventive maintenance. So that's something A and P has to do, but. An awful lot of NPs uh, have have done that. Um, as you know, in, in Sam's case, his, his AMP was a little hesitant, so he found another guy who had done it before and was perfectly comfortable doing it. And my guess is now Sam's mechanic, now having seen it done and having seen it was successful, they wouldn't hesitate to do it at this point. But he. The, Originally, he said he'd never done it, so he's a little hesitant to do it. And, and I think that's you know perfectly reasonable for a mechanic to be hesitant to do something he'd never done before without somebody who has done it before. You know, actually, there's a regulation that he's supposed to he's supposed to do anything he's never done before, except supervision of somebody who has done it before. So he was probably doing the right thing. Charles wonders, does the lapping procedure work for Continentals as well as Lycomings? Yeah, these this, these engines were Continentals, but yeah, it works it works with with Continentals and Lycomings. We've used it a lot on Lycoming engines, and it's it's uh, it's, it's it tends to be quite successful. If the valve isn't severely burned, we can usually um, you know bring the compression back to something quite quite good. Uh, but by lapping the valve, if if the leakage is past the valve, of course. Michael wonders if a cold compression test yields good results. Is there a need to repeat the test hot? Technically, no. Um, you know, it, it, the only reason we do compression tests, to be honest with you, is because it it. it it got written into the regs back in the 40s and it's it's still sitting there we 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 are required by regulation to do a compression test but you know it's a really terrible test and and the the bore scope is so much more dispositive of cylinder condition 
you know, I had one senior executive of, of Continental Motors some years ago say, you know, if, 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 if it wasn't in the regulations, we, we, we would recommend not doing it at all. Um, but it has to be done. And so Continental, uh, you know, years ago, uh, changed their, overrode the FAA standard, which was, the FAA standard was that a cylinder had a, had, a, had a compression of at least 60 over 80. And Continental came out with a service bulletin, which is now part of the standard practices manual. It said, no, 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 it's not 60 over 80 for Continentals. Uh, we use a master orifice to determine the no-go threshold. And for most compression testers, that master orifice threshold is down in the low 40s. Um, because Continental recognized that an awful lot of cylinders were being necessarily because of low compression, but they couldn't just do away with a compression test, which is what they really wanted to do, because it's it's written into the regulations. We have no choice but to do compression test during an, an annual inspection. Keith's wondering, can you rock the prop back and forth to bring the compression up during a test? Oh, for sure. For sure, you know, th there's kind of an old saying which is is really true <laughs> uh, that that an ANP can get any compression reading he wants to on the cylinder. You know, if he wants to change a cylinder, he can make the compression look bad, and if he wants to rescue it, he can make it look good by manipulating the propeller just right. Um, th there's th there was one um, Continental service bullet. I don't know if it's still out or not. It was years ago. They basically said when you're doing a compression test, if you bring the piston up to top dead center in the normal direction of rotation, you don't like the reading you get, try bringing it up in the opposite direction of rotation and, and, and use whichever reading is better. Um, but, you know, all of these things are indicative of the fact that the, the, the compression test is, is a pretty horrible test. It, it, it's, it's got very poor repeatability. It's terribly um uh, uh dependent on the technique of the mechanic and whether he did it hot or cold and how he manipulated the prop and stuff and and it it's just it's really a rotten test and we we just hate to and well i'll say it more strongly than that our clients we we do not permit cylinders to be pulled solely on the basis of compression um there has to be a stronger reason to pull a cylinder than than what the compression reading says because the compression reading is so unreliable. Chris says, I have 60 over 80 compression air leaking from exhaust during the test. Is it time to lap the valve or do I wait till it gets worse? Uh, what it, it depends on what kind of engine it is. Uh, if you're if it's lycoming, lycoming is still the old school thing that says that, that that they want 60 over 80 or better. So it's a lycoming, and, and the compression is down to 60 over 80. You you want to lap the valve. If it's continental, I'd probably let it, let it go a little further. But I'll, I'll also say that you know if you if, if if regardless of what the compression is, if you're if you are doing a bore scope inspection, which you really ought to be doing. And you see a valve, an exhaust valve that's starting to look a little funky. Um, that's the time to lap the valve. Don't don't let it get so bad that it's beyond lapping. You know, if you, if you start to see the valve um, uh, looking uh, a little non-symmetrical, which is really the, the the acid test, is it does it look symmetrical under the microscope or does it look asymmetrical? If it starts, if it starts having an asymmetrical pattern of deposits indicating that there's a hot spot somewhere, um, the, the time to lap the valve is, is as, as soon as you notice that, uh, because you don't want it to get so bad that that it's beyond uh, being a good candidate for lapping. And what would make it beyond being a good candidate for lapping is either if if, if the valve has lost a lot of metal in the contact area, or if the valve has started to warp, um, either of those things would would, would make the, the valve too sick to really be able to revive through lapping. 
Mark asks, you keep calling it a compression test, but it sounds like you're doing a leak down test, right? I think I just said that, yes. <laughs> I probably said it after he typed his question, but yes, I, that's exactly correct. It really should be called a leak down test. All right, Alex is wondering, can you explain staking the valve? Yes, I can. Um, that, that's also a procedure. I, th I think it's actually documented in, in, in content guidance is to try. Um, the taking a valve means if, if an exhaust valve, if, if, you, if you're getting chromic compression, compression reading leakage out the exhaust valve, um, they, rec they recommend trying to um, pull a rocker cover to expose the valve turn. And then with the cylinder pressurized, uh, pressurized with the with the compression tester, uh, take like a rubber mallet and tap the rocker to to kind of joggle the valve and see if you can get it to seat a little better. And once in a while, uh, staking the valve is successful. It's 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 simply it's it's simply a technique for trying to to improve the compression reading on on a cylinder that's about to flunk um just by by kind of joggling the valve and trying to get it into into a position in the seat that that sells a little bit better and that that's an officially authorized and very crude procedure it doesn't really fix anything it just it's just an attempt to get the compression reading to come up kind of like what i was saying about you know trying to rotate it in the opposite direction it's just not trying to try or wiggling the the propeller at top dead center and trying to find the sweet spot all of those things are are legitimate tags to try to maximize the compression reading which you know it sort of says something about what a terrible test it is um but it doesn't you know staking the valve doesn't really improve anything it's just trying to improve the compression reading on the, on the gauge um lapping the valve actually fixes the problem you know it it, it kind of re uh, uh, surface the you know the, the the area of the valve and the area of the seat they're in contact with one another to try to to you know to make them fit together very nicely um, and it also cleans off any deposits that have built up which may be responsible for the for the leakage is just you know deposits on the seat uh and it cleans those off and stuff like that that's why it, it's 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 pretty effective but staking doesn't really fix anything it's just an attempt to get the the gauge to come up a little bit john wonders when you lap an exhaust valve do you spin the valve in one direction only or in both directions um i think it's a matter of, of personal preference um i think i think most of the most of the people that I've watched do it have, have just spun it in one direction. I don't know if there's an advantage of spinning it both ways, but I don't see any problem with it. Rick is wondering, and of do course, the small... you, 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 can instant, you can get instant gratification when you're doing this because you, you, you lap the valve for a little while and then you hook the compression tester up and see how you did. And if you don't like it, you lap it a little bit more <laughs> until you, until, you know, you, you get it as good as it seems like it's going to get you can also take a pretty good look at it uh and and see that the that the surfaces are nice and 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 shiny both on the seat and on the on the valve james is wondering do you lap intake valves also i've never heard of anybody doing that um the, the, the intake valves almost never are a problem uh i mean I, I i i just i don't ever remember seeing a cylinder that had low compression with leak out the intake valve they, they they tend to because they run you know cool and there there's really nothing attacking them um but i mean in theory you could you could lap an intake valve i'm i'm just i just i'm not sure that there's any need to do that 
Joseph is wondering, is there a solvent method to remove carbon buildup between the valve stem and valve guide if the valve is sticking? Um, well, no. And the problem is that that if the valve is sticking, it's real. It's 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 a very common misconception that that it's sticking because of carbon buildup. It's really not carbon buildup. It's a, it's a a, a buildup that that is um, is a uh, a, a salt of lead and it, it it's due to the to the lead in the in in our in our uh gas and um deposits are um extremely hard and and nasty and they really aren't soluble in anything um i i think I think Ed told me at one point that the only thing that has would have a chance of of dissolving them would be would be scald, boiling water, but you're not really gonna be able to put boiling boiling water in a cylinder. I think that would do more harm than good. So um, the issue that there really isn't isn't anything you can do to remove those deposits. Um, Joseph is wondering, does the solvent flush work with a chromed cylinder wall? Sure. Yeah, I mean, there's, it, it doesn't, it works just fine with, with chrome. And Rick is wondering, do the smaller continentals have rotator caps? Um, that's a good question. I'm, 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 I'm not at all sure that like O two hundreds and O three hundreds that that kind of thing uh, do, but I know that the the three sixties and the five and the five fifty all have roto, they call them roto coils. But I'll, I'll speak, but yeah, it's rotator caps on the exhaust valves. William wonders what's the rope trick. Oh, the well, <laughs> the the rope the rope trick is you, you do the rope trick when you're when you're lapping the valves. The the, the rope trick has to do with uh, how you remove the the valve springs uh, from a valve, which of course you have to do if you're going to be lapping the valve. And the rope trick consists of um, stuffing a, a bunch of rope into the combustion chamber through the um, uh, through a spark plug hole. And then turning the prop to push the rope hard up against the uh, the valve, uh, so that you can compress the spring with a spring compressor and and take out the um, uh, the keepers uh, and remove the valve springs. So it, the rope trick is just is just a trick for holding the valve firmly closed by putting on it piston and a bunch of rope that stuck in the cylinder in order to remove the valve springs. Kurt asks, if an owner wants to do the flush, would you assume that uh, he or she should probably take their oil sample before so, so as not to contaminate the <laughs> sample? The lab would probably freak out if they found the xylene. No, absolutely, of course. Yeah, if you're taking an oil sample, the the this procedure is going to completely uh, contaminate the oil in the engine, and and uh, so yeah, you would take an oil sample before you uh, you did that procedure for sure. And then the when you're done with the procedure, you 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 drain everything out and you push fresh oil in the engine. Oh, and also, and and this is all written up in the procedure, but but also uh, after you do the ring flush, you wash all the oil off the cylinder walls. And um, so the, one of the last things that we do is squirt a bunch of oil into the cylinder and, and run the piston up and down to smear it on the cylinder walls. Because right after you do the ring flush, if you if you rotate the prop, you, you'll you'll hear a, a kind of a fingernail on a blackboard sound in the cylinders because the the, the cylinder is completely devoid of lubricant. Um, so the one of the last things you do uh, in the procedure is is to re-oil the cylinder to to put a nice film of oil on the cylinder walls again. 
William was wondering any way to deglaze a cylinder wall without removing the cylinder. Uh, not that not that we are aware of, no. Uh, Charlie's just wondering, any downside to running the engine on the ground with cowls off to get CHTs hot to do a hot compression check? Um, if you're going to run the engine on the ground with the with the, uh, the cowling off, it, you should not run it much above RPM. You know, there's really no um, cooling airflow. Um, with the cowls off and uh and so the, the there's if you try to get much run it at much power there's are gonna go out around and have hot spots and stuff it's it's really pretty abusive we really don't like to run with the cowls off and it, but if you if you do it should be at very low power he says uh mike in the aopa podcast Ask the AMPs that was released yesterday. You mentioned that you were hearing about problems with new rebuilt engines coming out of Lycoming recently. Can you please elaborate? Is there anything we can do to improve our chances of getting a quote unquote good engine? Um, the 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 stuff that I've been hearing is is really kind of second and third hand. I don't I don't I don't have any real specifics except uh, I'm hearing an increasing number of complaints about uh, engines that that had to go back to the factory and um, just as for this general sense that there's a QA problem there and. You know, we're we're having a terrible staffing problem throughout the industry. Um, that's one of the reasons that the lead time on engines and engine parts now is just like astronomical, um, because it's just been hard for companies to get people to go back to work after after COVID. And um, uh, the the anecdotal information that 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 I'm getting is that that that, that it's resulted in some uh, the assurance problems, and I've been hearing problems both about Continentals and Lycomings uh, lately more than more than I'm used to hearing. But it, I, you know, I don't I don't have any real hard detailed information that I keep on the subject. It's more of a general impression that I'm getting. Richard is wondering, can you see valve rotation on the ground with a bore scrope while rotating the prop? Well, if while well, rotating the prop, probably you probably can't. Uh, the valve rotates only a, a tiny fraction of a degree each time it opens and closes. But if the if 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 the valve has some obvious asymmetry to it under the bore scope. In other words, a valve that you'd be worried about. Um, and then if you if you went and ran the engine a little bit and then stuck the bore scope in again, you, you should be able to see that the, the, that asymmetry changed position. Uh, another thing to do that's a little more work is to is to you know pull off the um, uh, the rocker cover and and you know kind of make a, a mark on the valve stem uh, with a sharpie or something like that and then run the engine and see if the mark has moved. Uh, well, like I say, we, we, when we're doing when we're lapping uh, valves, particularly on continentals, we'll we'll just replace the the rotator on general principles. I mean, you have to take it off anyway. You might as well put a new one on. Najar asks, does the intake valve also have a rotator? No, exhaust valve. And Tom's wondering, is there anything you can do? What if the low compression is from a defective exhaust valve guide? 
Well, the the, the um the guide itself can't cause low compression. What it can do is is create a situation where the where the valve um, it loses its 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 concentricity with the seat and sometimes sometimes closes a little bit crooked. Um, but my experience with extremely ultra high time cylinders and stuff on on my continentals because as you know i've taken those engines to ridiculously high times is that the valve can be amazingly sloppy in the guide and and have little compression um if you watching it under the bore scope it's, it's fun it's kind of fun to watch a an exhaust valve with a really worn guide under the bore scope because because you rotate the prop and open and close the valve and as the valve uh, closes and and comes into the seat, it, it'll it'll joggle to the side to to center itself in the seat because because which is sort of an indication of of, of how worn the guide is. Um, but uh, you know, I I've seen for myself that the guide can be worn pretty badly, and the cylinder still um, have decent compression and make and and good power. Corey was wondering, um, any ideas why Sam's left engine number four cylinder with Warren Barrel had so much wear with relatively low hours? No, it was. It, I think I think we said it was eleven hundred hours, and uh, it looked pretty bad for eleven hundred hours. I I don't know why it was as worn as it was. All I know is we saw the borescope image and said the cylinder is pretty pretty seriously is a pretty seriously worn barrel and we're, we're we're not as optimistic that we're going to be able to save it but it's worth a shot and we were able to save it but i don't know for how long it, it, he may get another year or two out of it i don't know joe's wondering how do you prevent rings from being clogged well i'll tell you one really good one Use unleaded fuel. If if you've got an engine that's eligible to run on either unleaded MoGas or 94 UL or something, um, the 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 biggest problem we have with with that clogging is due to the fact that we're we're running we're running leaded fuel, and um, you know the uh, the the quicker we can move to unleaded fuel, the the better it's going to be because the, the, a lot of these problems are, are due to the fact that we're running leaded fuel. William wonders, is there any concern over lapping a valve with a turbocharged engine, thinking of the lapping compound going through the turbo? No, no issues whatsoever. Stuart wonders, can you tell me if using one quart of oil every two hours is excessive? It's an O540 lycoming with 1700 hours. Yeah, it's 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 excessive. Um, it's it's um, uh, it's not so excessive as to render the engine unairworthy, but it is. It's it's an awful lot, and it's it, it it if the engine is burning that much oil, it's definitely worth doing a little detective work to try to find out why. All right. That might be uh, it. that might be it. That might be a good candidate for for a solvent flow. <laughs> hmm. Gary wonders, will advancing, advanced timing cause burned exhaust valves? Um, no, no, uh, advanced timing will not cause burned exhaust valves. Nicholas Actually, wonders- if you think about it, if you, if you think about it, advanced timing um, actually, lowers exhaust gas temperature. 
So if, if, if anything, advanced timing would be very kind to the exhaust valve because the, when the exhaust valve opens, the, the gas that's passing out of it is, is going to be a lot cooler than it would be with, with less advanced timing. Uh, Nicholas wonders, after flushing the cylinders and servicing the engine with fresh oil, how many hours should be on the new oil before changing it? Just a normal oil change. Whatever your normal oil change interval is, nothing special. And William just wonders, is the valve lapping procedure and ring flush routine applicable to Rotax engines? Well, um, I don't see any reason why not, but but I've never personally worked on Rotax engines, so um, I, I can't really say from firsthand experience. I don't see any obvious reason why it wouldn't be applicable to any flat engine mm -hmm. or any engine, any even round engine, maybe. <laughs> I guess one more reason to do what Rotax says, and that's use um, unleaded um, gasoline in the engine, and then you probably wouldn't run into the issue. Yeah, Ro I mean, that Rotax is, a, is a, a great example because, you know, if, if they allow you to use avgas but if you use avgas more than a very small percentage of the time uh all of your maintenance intervals are, are, are much shorter you have to do a lot more a lot more maintenance on the engines if you run them on leaded fuel than on unleaded fuel all right mike well it looks like we're kind of reaching the end of our time limit here and uh, i think we'll go ahead and closer down here we had uh, 1100 and probably 50 people at least log in tonight so just lots of people interested in this subject a lot of great questions a lot of repetitive questions I apologize if your specific question wasn't answered i literally probably had 400 questions come in though so as you can imagine we don't get to all of them so appreciate your patience on that mike take a moment and and share closing thoughts with everybody Okay, well, first of all, thank you for putting up with my slow internet connection. Hopefully, this will repeat uh, next month. Um, if you'd like to get on my email list uh, for uh, our weekly main stories, I, like, like we, I wrote up Sam's story a, a, a little while back and sent it out to our mailing list. Uh, and our monthly newsletter, um, you can sign up. Um, by texting the word savvy s a v v y to 33777 and a little bot will then ask you for your email address and add it to our list or or you can sign up uh, by going to the website at savvyaviation.com or checking the box on the post webinar survey that Tim's going to put up if you will hang around the survey which I'm sure he would much appreciate um as always, books are. Um, I I don't know if the is the Home Builders Week special still on, Tim? They were selling uh, the books yeah. at twenty percent off. Uh, I think it's till midnight tonight, actually, February second. Yeah, so that'd be till midnight tonight, Mike. So if they go there and order tonight and okay, use the well, discount code H B W A Q two. Well, what's that? What's that discount code again? H B W E E K two two. Okay, home H B week two two. Terrific. Okay, well the books are twenty percent off at the EAA bookstore. Um, so it'll be a good chance to, to to get any of those books if you don't have them. And if you do have them, I'd be grateful if you would post reviews to Amazon. Uh, um, once again, our we we do a monthly podcast it comes out on the first of every month so the the latest one just came out yesterday uh where um uh Cole sterling and paul new and i um answer answer questions on the podcast about you know, all sorts of maintenance things and we try to have a lot of fun in the process 
and um, doing webinars um, is the first Wednesday of each month. Uh, the March webinar uh, titled "Teardown Needed" it talks about how we uh, how we decide whether it's ne whether it's necessary to tear down an inch, typically if it's metal or something, how we make the decision. Awful lot of engines get torn down unnecessarily, uh, so we'll go through that logic a little bit. Um, April, uh, I'm going to be talking about report cards, uh, which is an analytical tool uh, that we have for um, comparing how your airplane is doing with a whole lot of other airplanes of the same kind. It's it's pretty interesting. And um, finally, the May webinar, which I've titled Tulip Fever, <laughs> uh, because of the way the the used airplane market is right now. It's it's hotter than a pistol. I don't think anybody's ever seen airplane market uh, the way it is right now. But we'll be talking about the, the importance of uh, of not cutting corners and uh, and and doing a really thorough pre buy. So that's all I have uh, until uh, until this time next month, Tim. Well, thank you so much, Mike, for the great presentation. And to everybody who tuned in tonight, thank you so much for joining us. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Night, everybody. <laughs>